Greetings, geologists, for the finale of the Mesozoic era, and that indeed it is. The word Cretaceous comes from the prefix creta, which means chalk. And chalk comes from the numerous marine organisms that created chalk-based limestone during the Cretaceous period. So marine organisms are a huge deal during the Cretaceous period, but that's not all that happened. We know that the most derived, meaning the most diversified and unique attributes in terms of evolution with non-avian dinosaurs occurred, the peak of pterosaurs occurred, the important evolution in the plant kingdom is going to occur, there's some really important stuff that happens in the Cretaceous period. And I shouldn't leave out plate tectonics. So let's get started learning about this remarkable time period and uh, see what you think at the end. Remember that we saw in stage one a breakup of Pangaea in the Triassic and stage two occurred in the Jurassic. Well, conveniently, stage three happens in the Cretaceous. So if you remember back from stage one and two, I had let you know Australia and Antarctica were still joined at the hip. Well, they're going to start to separate from each other by the end of the Cretaceous period. This is extremely important. And here's why. That's going to allow Antarctica to start to move south towards the southern pole. As that occurs, it's going to remarkably change global climate. But it hasn't completely happened yet. They're just starting to separate from each other and they're beginning, they're drifting apart. India by now has moved northward into the equatorial latitudes. And that's important because it's going to start to squash against and smash against Eurasia. So that really, that process begins even when it breaks apart in one of the earlier stages of Pangaea and begins its journey northward, but it's still going to continue on through the Cretaceous. I might even add that it's continuing on today. We still know that the Himalayas are uplifting about one inch a year, even in spite of gravity and erosion. So that means that the collision is still occurring in the modern day time frame. South America and Africa were completely separated we knew that they were pretty much separated in the Jurassic, but now we have a legitimate ocean basin that separates our continents. So the Atlantic is growing and will continue to grow and is still growing today. Greenland had finally separated from North America, which will also be another climatic driver in the Cenozoic as we start to get continents that align themselves in a way at each pole. So as the polar areas begin to get these continents, that's going to set the stage for some stuff that will happen towards the end of the Cenozoic. So when Groenland separated from North America and Europe, this is an important element that it becomes its own continent. And Europe is, is drifting away further from both North America and Greenland because of the mid-oceanic ridges known as the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. So what was going on in terms of paleogeographic information of the Cretaceous period? A lot, to be exact. We're going to see the Zuni Sea restart back up in the middle Cretaceous. It comes to kind of a standstill in the early Cretaceous. So it doesn't just stop. What I mean is that it regressed for a while and came back. So most all of the sloth sequences have a series of fluxes and where they'll have more than one set of sequences within the large sequence itself. And that's certainly the case for this one. Tippy Canoe was no different. Kaskaskia, Arb Soroka, there were series of fluxes of ups and downs and sea level. Well, once it started in the middle Cretaceous, by the late Cretaceous, we had a remarkable seaway that covered a very large region of our continent right in here. At greatest width, it is a remarkable place, which we'll talk about in just a minute. But you might note where things are covered by the ocean, and it should be no surprise that you'll see quite a bit of marine rock and marine fossils from those locations. So when you look at the coverage of the ocean, you can see it's predictable where you're going to find marine rock. I mean, no doubt that the Gulf Coast area 
Texas, all the way up through parts of the Midwest, and even parts of the Western states, all the way through Canada, are going to have a pretty rich fossil record and rock record from this Zuni time frame, which would be the Cretaceous Interior Seaway. So this seaway was bigger than what we saw in the Jurassic, which was the Sundance Sea. It was wider, it was more extensive, and it would have slight rises and falls, which would lead to depositional environment changes all over areas that were close enough to see that sea level change, and it would mark it in the rocks. And I can say Waco, Texas certainly has evidence of that, and we'll get to that shortly. In terms of plate tectonics, remember that on the East Coast, we have a passive margin. So any mountains that reside there are from the late Paleozoic. But on the Western Cordilleran, we're going to continue to see the severe orogeny, and we're also going to continue to see the uh, Nevadan orogenies. And they'll complete their work, but we'll see another one literally at the tail end of the Cretaceous, probably the most famous and the most important to have a conversation about, and that's the Laramide orogeny. All dealing with this plate that's colliding against the western margin of North America called the Farallon Plate. What makes the Laramide orogeny so unique and different from the prior three events that happened in the Cordilleran was the angle of subduction. It is at such a low angle where most plates come in and the ocean plate makes a pretty nice dive. This one came in at a very low angle at about 10 degrees, so almost flat. And as it did that, that created a very unique set of circumstances to which mountains would get uplifted in the more interior sections of our craton, aka the modern day Rocky Mountain Range. So when you're referring to mountains about Rockies, you have to be very careful that you're not referring to the ancestral Rockies from the late Paleozoic, and you're referring to the ones that we currently have, which are the Rocky Mountain Range. So you're referring to the modern day Rocky Mountain Range. So let's take a peek and look at some of these events that were going on. We'll start back with the severe orogeny. Remember, that's named after a place in Utah. While this began in the late Jurassic, most of the severe orogeny is taking place during the Cretaceous period, and the subduction caused low angle thrust faults to form. Now, this was a high angle of subduction in comparison to the Laramide. So what's going to happen is you're going to pile up a whole bunch of uh, Paleozoic age sedimentary rocks on top of younger rocks. So that gives us a problem when it comes to looking at rocks in the field. Because if you recall from physical and even earlier in this course, we talked about the law of superposition. And I always tell students when we're first learning about the principles of geology that the law of superposition can uh, have a moment where it seems not to apply. And this is it. Now remember what the law says. It says all rocks are originally laid down in sequential order with the oldest at the bottom and the youngest at the top. So the law of cross-cutting relationships says that those rocks can uh, be moved or they can be uh, cut across and that can change the order essentially. So you could imagine if I have a low angle thrust fault that pushes rocks on top of another, which is exactly what a thrust fault is, I could take older rocks from down here. If we have a significant plate movement, I can actually push them right on top. And now I have older rocks on top of younger rocks. This is a common characteristic of what we see throughout the mountains, throughout the severe orogeny, and certainly in the Rocky Range. When I went on my sabbatical, we went up to Waterton Glacier International Peace Park, which you know is Glacier National Park on the U.S. side. It's Waterton on the Canadian side. And the Canadian Rockies are very famous for these thrust faults that have been created during the serogeny. And so we saw them, and probably the there's a really, really famous fault from out there that is associated 
with that region and we were able to see it and witness i mean without a shadow of a doubt not even knowing that's what we were looking at at first i was like oh there you go look at that you can see the rocks are shoved on top of the others and it's kind of fascinating to be able to see that and know that's what you're looking at so we're going to see a series of mountains that get made from montana to western canada and that's exactly the rocks i'm talking about right here all right, so the Nevada Mirogeny will continue, and there's really much, not much news there because it's finishing its work. But the new news is this one, the Laramide Orogeny. So very famous thing for North America because it uplifted the modern-day Rocky Mountain Range. And again, I need to underscore how important it is that you refer to the right Rockies. When you say Rockies, people just assume you mean modern. But for test purposes and for geologic purposes, geologists have to distinguish between ancestral and modern-day Rocky Mountains because they are two very different things. So by now, we don't have any ancestral Rockies left. Those are long gone. They built the rocks of the Mesozoic that we have laid down and even parts of the Permian rocks. And that's what makes the Southwest rock formations, to be frank. So the Laramide orogeny... Typically, in an orogeny, we'll see the mountains right along the edge of the margin of a continent. We don't see that. We see it more in the, in the interior sections of the continent. It's out of place. That's the bottom line. It's not where it really should be. So this event really starts at the true tail end of the Cretaceous. So most of our conversation about the Laramide will occur in the Cenozoic. And it's worthy to note here because it first uplifted in the very, very end of the late Cretaceous. And it would create a series of mountains and, I might add, volcanoes that are important to stuff that happens in the Cenozoic. When this event occurred, it uplifted basement rocks, our Precambrian for that matter, and it brought these granitic rocks to the surface. And that is a p important to note for part of the Colorado Plateau. And remember I said most of this happens in the Cenozoic. So the Colorado Plateau certainly got uplifted during the Cenozoic. So we'll have more conversations about this orogeny. But the key point is it makes the modern day Rocky Mountains. In part two, it had a very low angle of subduction around 10 degrees. Let's get back to the Zuni Sea because it is a true story that should be front page news when you're talking about the Cretaceous period. So by the late Cretaceous, the Zuni is in full force. And it's encroaching from the south and the north because we've got these mountains that have been uplifted all the way through the Mesozoic that we've got, and they are kind of blocking the western ocean from coming in. So as this ocean invades, it's going to invade from the south and from the north, and it makes this interior seaway right here. Well, take a look at the states that it covers, and it makes a really interesting story. As the Cretaceous interior seaway would slightly drop to regression, slightly rise because of transgressions, it's going to leave behind different rocks in exactly the same GPS location. So Waco, Texas, where McLennan College is, is no exception. It's going to see that marker, and we have a, a series of rocks that proves that. So if you were over on this side, let's say along the, the western edge of the seaway there, you would be able to see a different set of rocks, probably the shoreline and near shoreline rocks. But looking at where Texas is down here, we aren't going to have that. We're going to have the lagoonal and the open water rocks like limestones. So at greatest extent, this was a pretty wide seaway, up to 1,500 kilometers wide. So I need you to think about that from a dinosaur perspective for a minute. That is going to cause isolated communities. Learning, Remember learning about allopatric speciation and the importance of being isolated and having community separated. Well, this essentially does that because there's not going to be dinosaurs that are going to be able to swim 1,500 kilometers. Okay, so you may have marine reptiles, you and we certainly do, and we have a number of fossils from them that we'll learn about of certain key organisms from this time frame. 
So starting at the end of the Mesozoic, which would be the tail end of the Cretaceous, the Zuni is going to start its regression and it ends at the very beginning of the Paleogene. So what was the climate really like in the Cretaceous? I can only imagine it was warm, it was equitable, so you could go to Alaska and it not be like Alaska is today. And that's important because we know that as this water circulating throughout these oceans and seas, we're getting warm ocean climate water moving up to higher latitudes, which makes for warm, equitable, happy conditions. It's perfect for green stuff to grow. It's great for dinosaurs, especially dinosaurs who eat green stuff. Life is good. So we have a worldwide warming trend. It was a essentially a global warming event. And it was caused by these ocean currents as the continents are separating apart as Pangaea is fully erupted at this time. All right, I mentioned that we have evidence of these climatic changes in Waco, Texas, where the college is. And on the last slide, I showed you an ammonite. I didn't mention it because I wanted to correlate it and link it here. When we built the parking garage for the science building here, that particular fossil, let me go back one, was in the rocks, and I can remember Sid Ross, who kind of runs the physical plant stuff and does all the buildings, meaning he does construction, oversees that on campus. Sid has gone with me on field course for years, and he said, oh, you got to come see this. you got to come look at this. And I was like, wow, huge ammonites. And so I said, we want them. And he's like, where do you want them? I said, put them out in front of the science building. Let everybody enjoy them every single day. And now they're kind of icons because people know they're there and they like to look at them. Well, they're, they're, they're evidence. That's evidence that we were covered by a shallow sea right here in Texas during the Cretaceous period. So let's say you live in New York. Not the same situation, but you need to go back and look at that paleogeographic map and see what was going on. If you lived in California, a different situation. So you have to start considering that locations are going to vary based on the depositional environments. It just happens to be that Waco has a unique story. So this is part of Lover's Leap, and it's from the Bosque River Trail. And the Bosque River Trail uh, is maintained and owned by MCC. And these rocks right here are, they're over 20, probably 25, 30 layers total of limestone interbedded with shales. And actually it's a marl. Marl is M-A-R-L, and it's kind of a calcareous shale. So it's kind of a transitional rock between true shale and limestone. And so we, it's much softer, by the way, than the limestone. And so what you get is layer of limestone, layer of shaley marl, limestone, shaley marl, limestone, shaley marl. Occasionally, we'll just get a true layer of shale in there as well. Well, each one represents a distinctive depositional environment. So the true shale would represent like a lagoon. And then the marley shale is probably going to be a transition from lagoon to the wide open ocean. And then the limestone is wide open ocean far away from any terrigenous input of sediment. And if we see this cycle repeated over and over to the very top of the rock layer there, that represents at least 25 changes in sea level. Small ones, I might add, but enough to change the depositional environment right at the location where this picture was taken. So back in the Cretaceous period, all of this would have been a shallow sea. We could have had mosasaurs swimming around and plesiosaurs swimming around and ammonites. Well, we know we had ammonites because ammonites were in the fossil beds of these rocks. So it puts a whole new twist on it to you to look at it and see the rocks with a completely different personality. So if you went somewhere, let's say like Arizona or far west New Mexico, you might see a different type of sequences of rocks from the same transgression. You might see the beach line and the shoreline type stuff, which would be like 
uh, sandstones and siltstones, and you wouldn't see the limestone and shale because it wasn't in the right place to have that. So the climatic conditions worldwide are going to be recorded in the rock record, and we certainly see that. And I've traveled worldwide to see Cretaceous rocks, and in Waco is not the only place that has this documented change in sea level. So it's kind of an interesting thing to consider and understand that the Zuni went up and down. I'm not saying a dramatic up and down, but enough to make a, the depositional environment change and X marks the spot right here at least 25 times. And the Pennsylvanian, we learned a lot about the importance of cyclothems. So we're going to see more cyclothems get deposited during the Cretaceous period. It's not going to be as extensive as what we saw from the Pennsylvanian, but there's more of it, and here's the reason why. There's more coverage of ocean. So that means we'll have more marshy, swampy-like conditions that we could form. We just did not have as rich of a situation as we did in the Pennsylvanian coal swamps. So this coal that you see here that comes from the western United States, especially Montana and the uh, Powder River Basin area, they ship this stuff down to us by rail car, and then we blend it with the type of coal we have called lignite and use best available control technology known as BACT technology, which is air quality scrubbers and so forth to help blend a cleaner burning fuel source for us in the southern states. So this is an important resource and it is plentiful resource that we have. All right, so that brings us to some important rock layers in the central Texas region. I realize some of you don't live here, but these rocks have similar formations around the United States and even for that matter around the world where you saw a change in the Zuni Sea, meaning the Cretaceous Interior Seaway for us, but other locations would have names all related to the Zuni sequence going up and down slightly. So throughout central Texas we had some pretty hilly topography and that topography comes from a series of rock layers that were made during the Cretaceous period and they're part of a group of rocks called the Fredericksburg Group. So obviously Fredericksburg's a name of a town in Texas and it's a really great place to visit. Probably the, some of the best Fredericksburg Group's locations to see is right around Valley Mills, Texas. That's only like a 30 minute drive from Waco and uh, you would be taking Highway 6, kind of going west, out towards Stephenville. And as you drive through this area, go through Meridian, or if you're going to Glen uh, State, are you going to Glen Rose, which is where the Dinosaur State uh, Park is located, where the footprints of Cretaceous dinosaurs are, then you would expect to see these rocks. They make up that hilly topography. So I'm going to share with you why the topography is there and why it has the look that it does. So we have just outstanding marine fossils in Texas from the Cretaceous period because we were covered by the Cretaceous interior seaway for the duration of the Cretaceous once it flooded the continent and as it withdrew. The nickname for this group of rocks and the terrain that it creates is called the Lamb Passes Cut Plain. And the reason it's called a cut plain is it kind of looks like someone went in and cut sections of hills. They're very blocky, steep on the sides, flat on the top. They are caused by differential weathering of the three rock layers that we're fixing to discuss. And we will look at them as a group and show you how they create a remarkably unique landscape. And this would be a really good indicator of it. You see how steep this hill is and there's a cap rock at the top and then there's a softer rock down here and there'll be an even softer rock at the bottom. All right, well, let's talk about that. The cap rock at the top is created by a massively hard limestone called the Edwards. Depending on where you are, where the Edwards limestone crops out at the surface, and even where it is subsurface, it might depend on the characteristic of the Edwards as to how you would use it. I should note here that this is the infamous rock layer that contains the Edwards Aquifer, which is used as the primary drinking water resource for the city of San Antonio, and then uh, even Austin for that matter. So as we look at the Edwards limestone, 
it even crops out in parts of central Texas, and that's what makes the hills of the land passes cut plain. Why is it, I keep saying massive, not only is it thick, it's pretty durable, it's really hard, and it's made up of a lot of famous fossils like rudist. So we'll get to rudist here shortly, and that is like the word rude with an I-S-T at the end. It's a, a weird-looking bivalve, and these were unique reef-building bivalves, which were a critical reef builder during the late Cretaceous. So these rudest fossils are really strange looking, and when we get to them, I think you'll agree. This represents a deeper water deposit that occurred in central Texas to create this thick, massive limestone. Now, the reason the Edwards is such a great aquifer, it really shouldn't be with such a thick limestone. It's highly fractured from when the Balcones Fault moved in the Cenozoic, cracked it up, and then groundwater that's slightly acidic has been eating it away with carbonic acid. So this is a highly karsted limestone. So if you were at MCC campus in Waco, the limestone we have here is not heavily karsted. You got to go a little bit further south to see that Edwards limestone that's karsted. So I just want to let you know that you don't have to worry about MCC campus dissolving like a big cavern because it's not in the same dimension, not even on the same formation as the Edwards. But the Edwards makes the hills. It caps the hills. So if it's a cap rock, it's tough, it's hard. It kind of holds the stuff that's softer underneath it in place. My personal favorite of the three is the Comanche Peak Limestone, and that makes the steep hills of the Fredericksburg Group or the Lamb Passes Cut Plain. I can't tell you how many hours I spent out on these rocks. When I was working on my first thesis, I was comparing fossil faunal communities of the Comanche Peak and looking at the difference of concentrations of the types of fossils that existed there. And I can tell you, even within a 60-mile radius of Waco, I saw a remarkable difference in the communities of fossils. What I mean by that, some areas would have oyster banks. Some areas were dominated by echinoids, which are sea urchins. Some had a pretty nice balance of all of those animals. That indicates a specific type of depositional environment, and that was the goal of my thesis, was to try to correlate what that was going on. It was a lot of hard work. So today, I like to go out to the Comanche Peak and still look for fossils because it's a beautiful rock layer, and I found my favorite thing there, which are ammonites. I found one that's about, it's going on about four feet wide. And it was just sitting in the side right there. And I was like, wow, that is so incredible, awesome. Look at this thing, and it's just gorgeous. So, and that's sitting right in the middle of the Comanche Peak. One thing I noticed about the Comanche Peak, spending so many hours with it, it's very nodular. And I think you can see what I mean by nodular. It looks like it has big nodular things in it. Well, it does, and it's just this marly limestone, and it's much softer than the Edwards. So there are parts of the Comanche Peak you can literally just take with your fingers and bury into it, and it crumbles, and other parts are rock solid. You need a rock hammer and a chisel to begin to get it open. I think that this represents a shallow marine environment that was somewhat lagoonal. A kind of a transitional area and it's going to have some really important fossils like echinoids and a famous type of one that is kind of heart shaped it's really pretty ammonites bivalves you'll see an occasional coral and rudist as well and that's just to name a few and so let's take a look at some of the common things you'll see this is a rudist and we'll talk more about that in a little while these are gastropod casts, and I mean, you can find these a dime a dozen in the Comanche Peak, and they're pretty big. I mean, I found some that were at least three or four inches long. I keep thinking I should make keychains out of them or necklaces and sell them because they're just awesome. They're just neat, and people like this kind of stuff. I certainly do. This is a bivalve, a very famous one called a gryphea. These are some of the common sea urchins you would find. This is the heart-shaped one right here, and this, of course, is a, an ammonite. And these are the common types of fossils that you'll find in the Comanche Peak. I might also add they're common in the next rock layer as well. So the walnut clay, it's the bottom layer. It's the floodplain layer. It's the one that makes up the bottom 
uh, flatlands. And we know for sure this changes in its character of rock type from being a marly limestone to being a clear shale. And I don't mean clear in the sense you can see through it, I mean it's clearly shale. <laughs> and so the shale unit is going to contain the same kind of fossil. So I think it was a very similar but closer to the shoreline environment as the Comanche Peak. Highly fossiliferous. And people find these fossils outside of the Comanche Peak and the, the Walnut Clay. And one reason is rivers go through these rock layers and pick up these fossils and then they get carried like regular rocks do during flooding conditions. So it's very common that you'll find these kinds of fossils in gravel beds. So if you've gone fossil hunting in Central Texas, you might have seen some of these fossils for that very reason. So what is a rudist? It's important to connect this life form to what we just saw. This is a rudist. Not all of them were this shape. Some were what these recumbent is what they're called, these types of um, rudists right here. And they're usually build one on top of the other. So these guys made colonial mounds. And bivalves are known for doing that. I can tell you that there is a, a really big problem throughout lakes in the United States and even unfortunately in Lake Waco now with a zebra mussel. Well a mus zebra mussel is just a form of a bivalve. It's an invasive species but one of the reasons that it's such a problem is because it builds reefal like structures. It will get in the insides of um, water intakes in a lake and completely block it out. So you can imagine how devastating that would be for public works if you have, in our case in this area, we rely on water intakes to Lake Waco for 100% of the water for the city of Waco. So these guys in geologic paths behave much like zebra mussels do today. I'm not saying they're invasive, I'm just saying that they grow in piles and mounds and they glue themselves together. So this is an elevator type of rudis. So it would have sat like this. This is actually one of these guys or these guys right here. And they would have a little lid at the top. So here's the structure. And the little lid would open up and down like this. It's really kind of cute. And so um, these rudis are found in huge concentrations, especially in the Edwards. Now, this particular specimens right here, I found very much in the Comanche Peak. So I can tell you they're found in all three layers, but in the type of the Edwards, one of the dominant types of rudis you'll see in the Edwards is this stuff right here. And one of the reasons is that it's a flatter type of rudis, so it would have been able to withstand a higher water pressure than some of the elevator types. So this is a really interesting thing, and we know that it represents shallow marine environments because rudis didn't grow anywhere else. Another interesting fact about rudis is they're excellent index fossils for the Cretaceous period. The reason being is they pretty much make their big entrance into the rock record by the tail end of the Jurassic, but they are just super prevalent throughout the Cretaceous, especially the late Cretaceous. So they are a valuable marker in rocks that tell us that we're in that Cretaceous interior seaway right here in Waco, Texas. This is what the Edwards looks like, and I can tell you by having seen a lot of Edwards crop ed, outcrops that this is exactly what you're going to look at. So let's look at this stuff, and then we're going to go back one, and we're going to show you what it is. You can see all these things in the rock. Well, that's this stuff right in here. That's what it is. And so as you look at that, you realize these guys could have built pretty low relief, meaning they weren't tall uh, reefs, but they were thick, and they were widespread, and they, they were much more dominant than corals were at this time during the Cretaceous period. All right, one of my favorite fossils are echinoids. I just love them. Now, this is a, a mega echinoid that's found in central Texas, and it's also Cretaceous in age, the exogyra. But when you're looking at this one, this is the most famous one right here in our area, and I've found just wads of these in our area too, but these are my personal favorites. I love them. These are little sea urchins that existed all over the Cretaceous seas that were in our area. What's interesting is that you can find these same fossils, and even rudis for that matter, and the next one we'll cover in pretty much all areas that had the Cretaceous interior seaway. So they're pretty widespread, knowledged, and identified for being index fossils of the late Cretaceous. 
We can't mention Cretaceous marine life without talking about Gryphea. Well, Gryphea is simply a bivalve, so understand it's a special type of one, but they're oysters. And as I did my research in the Comanche Peak, I was struck by some areas almost were exclusively dominated by this creature right here. Now, these are two different ones. I just have them sitting side by side on a table where I photograph them. And these are indicative of another rock layer right here in Waco called the Del Rio clay. All of that's Cretaceous stuff. So I would expect that you would find loads of Gryphea in true lagoons because that's where oysters live today. So I, I'm struck by the fact that you could go to an area that had Gryphea and you might find a 100 to 1 ratio of fossils in some of these areas where Gryphea just dominated. In other places, it wasn't so much so. What that told me in the areas that dominated in that kind of percentage or ratio, they were oyster banks. And oysters tend to live in banks together. And so it's really fascinating to look at that paleoecological neighborhood and start to interpret what it would have been like simply by looking at the fossil faunal assemblages that lived there. Right, there is no more famous marine life from the Cretaceous than the Ammonite. And it's most people's personal favorite just because it's awesome looking. And they were awesome. And they got huge during the Cretaceous, the biggest they would ever reach. And unfortunately, they bite the dust and go extinct at the end of the Cretaceous period. So I'd like you to imagine a six foot wide and tall one of these guys with a squid hanging out the end and then it starts to take on a different personality doesn't it not all of them were six feet wide i found some that were less than an inch wide in the del rio clay which is the cretaceous unit here in texas and so they they came in all shapes and sizes and a lot of different types of species but they're noteworthy because they are excellent markers in Cretaceous rocks, especially late Cretaceous rocks, for being index fossils of the Cretaceous interior seaway. Diatoms are another important marine life that we need to talk about. Now I'm going to give you some uh, personal information that's shared from having been married to a lawn care guy for years. My ex-husband runs a organic lawn care business and he taught me this. I mean, I knew about diatoms, but I didn't know that they can be useful to us in a way that most people are not aware of. Anyway, let's talk about what they are first, and then it'll make sense my story. Diatoms are microscopic phytoplankton. So essentially, they're microscopic little shelly animals, and this is kind of what they look like. What they're made out of is important. They make their shells or skeletons, it's really skeletons, out of silica. So silica is what quartz and stuff is made out of. That's important, same thing as glass. And that's gonna be important to my story in a minute. So they first appear during the Cretaceous. They're gonna become super important throughout the Cenozoic and they're gonna lay down huge deposits in the Cenozoic that we'll visit when we get to that point. Here's my little secret about diatoms. There's something called diatomaceous earth. Let me say that again, diatomaceous. So it's diatoms. All it is is diatoms. It comes under a lot of trade names, but essentially you go somewhere like a garden location, a home improvement store where they have gardening stuff, and ask somebody for diatoms. It's a white powder. That's going to be your clue. So here's what you need to do with that. If you have problems with fire ants, and who doesn't have problems with fire ants down here, right? you need to put some diatomaceous earth out. So like, say you have dogs outside and their ants are always getting in their food. Put fresh diatomaceous earth all over the exterior of where that food bowl is and even put some on the food. It won't hurt the dog at all. Actually give their coat a nice sheen color uh, and it's totally harmless to them, but it is death sentence to fire ants. Keep in mind, it's made out of silica, so as they walk across it, what happens is it cuts them in half. And 
as soon as it gets wet, it's ineffective. So if you have a rain event, you have to put fresh diatomaceous earth. So just a little bit of organic advice for you in the lawn care business. And I've been using it for years, and it's great. It works like a charm, and it's cheap. <laughs> Diadobs are cheap. So if you spend all this money on trying to combat fire ants, there's only two ways to solve fire ant problems. Put their natural predator back out, which are scorpions, and then use diatomaceous earth to try to solve the rest. So most people don't want to go the scorpion route. That's why we have such a fire ant problem in Texas. We've reduced their natural predator population. But we can control somewhat how they are nuisance if we can use diatomaceous earth in our defense. So diatoms, I have a special affinity for because I think that they are very helpful. And there's more uses for them besides just fire ants. All right, dinoflagellates. Let's talk about them. These are microscopic organisms as well, of phytoplankton. These organisms were so common during the Cretaceous and again are common throughout the Cenozoic even today. One really cool story I have about dinoflagellates is this. In the Bahamas, when I did some research on stromatolites at night, there was nothing to do on this island that we were on because like I mentioned in prior lectures it's about a mile long and half a mile wide and there's a maximum of about 20 people on the island at any time so it there's like nothing there <laughs> so you can just sit on the beach and there's no light pollution and you can watch the ocean surf and listen to it and at night the ocean waves glisten like Tinkerbell took her wand and just put little jewels in there that illuminate the water. That is dinoflagellates. And some of them are luminescent, where they glow. And they're just awesome looking. So as you're diving if at night, a lot of times you'll see the water will do this. And people are a little you know, struck back by what's all that glittery stuff, that glowing stuff. Well, it's usually dinoflagellates that are luminescent. And so I, I just think they're really neat. They're good markers in rock records for fossil evidence, but nevertheless, they're still with us today. The last animal I think we'll cover today before we move on to part two is the mosasaur. This was the fearsome predator in the marine oceans of the Cretaceous Interior Seaway. Now, these guys were late Cretaceous marine reptiles. They will go fully extinct in the extinction event at the end of the period. Some of these were not gigantic organisms, but some were monster huge. Some of the smaller species got up to about seven feet long, so maybe crocodilian-like, but others got up to three times that size. Can you imagine? This is about the meanest, fiercest, most scary thing that's ever swam in the ocean. So this is like much worse than any white shark that we have today, great white. And you could not pay me to go back to a Cretaceous ocean because I'd be scared to death of either being eaten by an ammonite, a plesiosaur, or worse, have coming in contact with one of these guys right here. So take your pick. Do you get eaten on land by a velociraptor? Do you get eaten on in the ocean by one of these guys? Take your pick, right? Um, if you're in the air, do you get picked up by a pterosaur? I don't know. I sure would like to go back to this time frame and see the ecosystem, but there's some serious stuff out there that's dangerous. They resemble plesiosaurs because they have paddle-like uh, arms or uh, these things right here. They're what you would call their paddles and they maneuvered very well efficiently in the water so if you saw the movie Jurassic World this is what was the big showcase guy that came up and ate uh, something in the movie you'll know exactly what I'm talking about and I've had students email me and call me ever since that movie's come out about this this guy they're like oh my gosh I know what that is that's a mosasaur and totally what they were so what did these guys eat pretty much anything they wanted I know ammonites would have been yummy steak so it is sharks and fish and birds marine reptiles I'm sure they went after pterosaurs I mean that would make sense they could have propelled themselves and come out of the water I think the movie did actually a pretty good look at how that would be possible so I bought this jawbone in Arizona at a trade show and I, it didn't come from Arizona. It actually came from Utah. The gentleman that was selling his fossils 
was just trying to make it through college, and he and his family do this for a living. And I was so excited to get this vertebrate fossil and be able to have it for the collection. And as we discussed it, you know, I was just so taken back by how well the teeth were preserved. And a lot of students are as well because they realize that these teeth, you're like, it looks like it just died yesterday. Well, this is a, a Cretaceous age Mosasaur, about 80 million years old. And so it is remarkably preserved because the enamel is one of the best parts of the tooth that stays intact and can be buried for long stretches of time. So this is a great place to take a break. And when we return, we'll be talking about the remaining of the life forms from some other reptiles and insects and plants and, of course, dinosaurs. So stay tuned and rejoin me for the most exciting part of the finale when we return. See you back then. Bye.